When people use the term landscape, what they often have in mind is somewhere rural, somewhere fairly remote, and above all somewhere special, somewhere like a national park or an area of outstanding natural beauty. But in fact landscape isn't necessarily any of those things. It can be urban as well as rural and it's all around us, all the time. So in some ways it's totally mundane, just the everyday world in which each of us lives. The character of a landscape develops through time, shaped by the interaction of natural factors, for example geology, topography, ecology, climate, with human activities like settlement, agriculture, industry and so on. And there's another really crucial factor that shapes landscapes, our perceptions. Different groups and individuals will see the same place or landscape in very different ways. What a particular landscape means to me is not identical to what it means to you. Today we're going to be exploring an area which I hope will be familiar to some of you at least, which is around the northwest corner of the main university campus. And this is part of the landscape that used to be really rural right up until the end of the 18th century, but is now very much suburban. And we're going to be starting our tour just up there near that rather scary 1950s water tower. We're standing here on top of one of the highest parts of a ridge of moraine. Moraine is a mixture of sands and gravels and clays and all this was dumped by a glacier as it retreated about 14,000 years ago. And this ridge extends all the way from the east bank of the River Ouse right down to the new university campus at Heslington East. So behind me is a mound known by some people at least as Seawood's How. Now How is an interesting word because that can mean a burial mound and Seawood was the Earl of Northumbria, probably of Danish heritage, who died in York in 1055. So that's only 11 years before 1066 which saw the famous Battle of Fulford. <laughs> and that other battle What's that one called? Anyway, so was this the burial monument of a famous Danish Earl? Well that's certainly what's been widely believed since the mid 19th century. is that early maps of York don't make any mention at all of Seawood. They just mark this as Mill Hill. And in 1849 a local writer recorded that this was called Heslington Mount. Now that's not as different from Mill Hill as it sounds because the word mount is often used to describe the artificial mounds that windmills were built on from the late medieval period onwards. The issue of the place name doesn't stop there either because locally this area is known as Garrow Hill and that word Garrow is a corruption of gallows and gallows were often built on high ground sometimes even on artificial mounds like burial mounds so that the corpse of the executed victim as it swung there in the breeze was a visible reminder to everybody to obey the law. Nearby is Thief Lane which is another place name often associated with places of execution. <laughs> 
As if all that wasn't enough, a few years ago a local archaeologist pointed out that this mound looks rather like late Neolithic burial mounds, like another how, Duggleby How, which has been excavated and proven to be late Neolithic, on the wolds to the east of York. So, what is this? Is it Earl Seawood's burial place? Is it a Neolithic burial mound built for another famous individual nearly 4,000 years earlier? Or is it a late medieval windmill mound? How are we going to find out? Well, one way of course would be to dig a blooming great trench right through the middle of the thing in search of some conclusive dating evidence. But excavation would be time consuming and expensive and complicated and if we're honest there's no guarantee that it would even come up with the conclusive evidence we were hoping for. On top of that excavation would do quite serious damage to a popular local landmark. Plus on the strength of the 19th century interpretation that this was Seawood's burial place this is now a scheduled ancient monument in other words it's protected by law so we'd have to do a lot of negotiation with historic England before we were allowed to excavate. Now landscape archaeology doesn't exclude excavation far from it excavation provides a really useful aspect of the evidence we use but in recent decades the term landscape archaeology has come to be applied to a whole suite of techniques that are collectively known as non-destructive or non-invasive. In other words, they don't damage the things that they're trying to interpret and understand. So those techniques include things like standing building survey, aerial survey, geophysical survey, and what we're doing today, which is field survey. And field survey is really, in essence, just wandering round taking a good hard look at everything you can see with the naked eye and trying to make some sense of it. And if you think about it, that's probably the oldest archaeological technique there is. It's probably been in existence as long as humanity itself. And we can combine the evidence that we get from field survey with other forms of evidence. Old documents, particularly old maps, photographs, past and present, aerial photographs of course, people's memories and critically earlier research as well and at that point we're starting to do what I would call landscape investigation because it's really a kind of detective work. So how can we use field survey to attempt to date this mound and understand what it was for? Well two ways. First of all we're going to scrutinise the mound itself to see if we can tell anything from that. And second, we're going to look at the wider area, the context of this mound, and see if that tells us anything about it. So what can we infer about this mound just by looking at it? Well, it's roughly circular, it's more than head height, it's pretty big. None of those characteristics really get us very far though, in terms of our three scenarios we've thought about. What else? Well, it's got a very flat top. That might hint that there was a structure like a windmill standing on the top, for example. When you see a mound, it's always a good idea to ask where the material to build it might have come from. And in this case, that's not at all clear. There's definitely no encircling ditch that we can see on the surface, which we might expect if it was a burial mound of some sort, whether, whether it was Anglo-Saxon or Neolithic. now in a field about 200 metres west of the mound. Now this land used to be owned by the Yarborough family who lived at Heslington Hall but it's now in the ownership of the university. There are some surface remains that we can date reasonably accurately just by looking at what's on the surface. Here we're looking at ridge and furrow, that's the remains left by medieval ploughing. Each of these strips you can see was effectively a separate field farmed by a separate peasant family. If we look at aerial photos taken before the woodland grew up in the 1960s, we can see how far this expanse of ridge and furrow used to extend before the university campus was developed. Seawood's Howe, or Heslington Mount, whatever we're going to call it, is hidden under a clump of trees but you can see that the ridge and furrow carries on right up to the mound and beyond it. <laughs> 
sure enough, there's ridge and furrow here in the woods as well. And where this modern university access road, Seawoods Way, cuts through the ridges, we've even got a ready-made excavated profile through the medieval plough soil. So this is where field survey becomes rather like excavation, because if we can work out a stratigraphic relationship between the medieval ploughing and the mound, in other words whether the mound or the ploughing came first, then we're a long way towards answering our question about the date of the mound and therefore its function. Even at this time of year, it can be hard to see very far ahead of you in woodland. So at a glance, it's pretty difficult to tell which comes first, the medieval ploughing or the mound. And as we've seen, aerial photographs don't allow us to see through the tree canopy either. But there's another source of information we can turn to, and that's LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. Now LIDAR is our, effectively a high resolution scan of the ground surface taken from either a drone or a light aircraft and if we want to we can use an algorithm to strip off the trees so that we can see the surface of the ground underneath them naked as it were. The data on which these images are based has been collected by the Environment Agency to assist with flood modelling in and around York and from this we can see hints that the furrows of the medieval ploughing line up perfectly on either side of the mound in other words, that the mound was built after the medieval ploughing had come to an end. Back in 2016, as a teaching exercise for first year undergraduates, we took a more low-tech approach and surveyed the mound and its surroundings on the ground, just using tape measures to plot the slopes. This survey also indicated that the mound is later than the medieval ploughing. In other words, it cannot be the burial place of Earl Seawood, but instead is probably a windmill mound dating to the end of the Middle Ages, or later still. So why might the name of the mound, as well as its interpretation, have changed so dramatically and suddenly around the middle of the 19th century? Well, one possibility is that somebody was manufacturing a fictional story to try and make this rather utilitarian mound sound a little bit more exciting, a little bit more of a local historic landmark because around the time that that renaming took place, a ring of trees was planted right around the base of the mound. This is the only one that still survives. And this is what we call in this country a London plane tree, because they were planted there in great numbers. But actually it's an exotic import from North America, and they became very popular in this country around the end of the 18th century. We know that in the 19th century, Successive heads of the Yarborough family took a keen antiquarian interest in the past, like many wealthy landowners of their time. Consequently, when they rebuilt Heslington Hall, they faithfully copied the original Elizabethan design, even incorporating fragments of the original building into the new work. They also kept elements of the historic gardens, including the canal of Elizabethan date and the yew trees, which came in the 18th century. And we know that they sponsored archaeological work in the surrounding area. And this mound stands on their land, so in my view there's nobody more likely to want to turn dull old Heslington Mount into exciting, mysterious Seawoods Howe. So, we've looked at how we can treat a single monument as a landscape and how we can use non-destructive techniques to address questions about its date and function. Questions that would have been more complicated and time-consuming and expensive to address through excavation. And in the process, we've demonstrated that this cannot be the burial place of Earl Seawood of Northumbria, or indeed a late Neolithic burial mound. And yet, we know that Seawood's Howe really did exist because it's mentioned in a string of medieval documents, the earliest dating to 1189. And by the 14th century, it had actually had a windmill built on top of it. So, where was the real Seawoods Howe? Well, to answer that question, we're going to have to turn our attention to the wider landscape. The far western boundary of the block of ridge and furrow that we were looking at earlier 
is defined by this road, which immediately tells us that the road was also in existence in the Middle Ages. In fact, the name Green Dyke Lane, just one dyke back then, was first recorded in a document written down in 1374. So, what was the Green Dyke? Well, a dyke is just a bank and ditch. And if it was described as green in 1374, that probably tells us that it was constructed at a much earlier date and had become overgrown with grass by the time it was named. There's nothing obvious to see on the ground today, but it's noticeable in places that the road runs through a broad, deep hollow. There's another clue to the date of the lost earthwork, because the line of the road marks the boundary between the township of Fulford, over there, and the township of Heslington, over there. Now, township and parish boundaries were usually established before the Norman Conquest. So that takes us back maybe another 400 years before 1374. Lastly, we have to look at where Green Dykes Lane runs. It stretches right across the top of the glacial ridge. Assuming the original Green Dyke followed the same course, the earthwork would have blocked or controlled movement along this spine of dry ground between the valley of the Tanghall Beck on the north and the low-lying boggy ground of Low Moor on the south. Linear earthworks like this one, known as cross ridge dykes, survive in fair numbers on the Wolds to the east and on the North York Moors, where they usually seem to have acted as territorial boundaries. In terms of date, the earliest examples may belong to the late Neolithic, but the majority seem to have been constructed in the Bronze and Iron Ages. All this is very interesting, I hear you say, but what's it got to do with Seawards Howe, which is, after all, a quarter of a mile that way? Well, I mentioned that Seawards Howe turns up in a string of medieval documents, and if you read those documents carefully, they seem to imply that Seawards Howe lay to the west of the Green Dykes, not to the east. In other words, it lay within Fulford Township, not within Heslington Township. And in the next film, we're going to look at how this lost prehistoric earthwork continues to structure the development of the landscape right into the present day.